Um, welcome everyone, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to our webinar series, Come and Learn. My name is Günther Jukeli and I will be the moderator of this uh, webinar. I'm delighted that Matthias Künzel is our speaker today. We had, um, I think, 10 talks in this series, but we have not touched the issue of Islamic anti-Semitism. This is one of the many contentious issues when anti-Semitism is really discussed in depth. Our goal is to foster scholarly and productive discussions on the different facets of contemporary anti-Semitism. Please visit our website to see upcoming webinars and recordings of past webinars. Our speaker uh, today, Matthias Künzel, will be introduced by Alvin Rosenfeld, director of the Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism here at Indiana University. Matthias Künzel's talk will be about 35 to 40 minutes and then followed by our usual uh, Q&A session. Um, and then we will invite you to join us uh, to come to the panel and ask your question directly. I will explain that again after Matthias' uh, talk. You can also use the chat function and this will be visible to all panelists, um, but we will then give priority to the direct discussion. But if we come to that, we will also discuss the questions and comments in the chat. Uh, Professor Rosenfeld, the word is the word is yours. Thank you, Gunter and uh, Matthias. Let me add my welcome to Gunter's. It's really a special pleasure to have you with us. Normally, that's at conferences in Bloomington. If I'm not mistaken, you've been to every one of our conferences. Yes, we, sir. We've also met together in conferences in Europe and Israel. I look forward to the day when that'll be possible. But for now. It's good to have uh, this opportunity to hear you online, particularly on this subject. Gunter uh, just alluded to the vital importance of understanding the subject you will be talking about. Uh, recently, those of us who follow um, this matter are encouraged by some encouraging developments in certain Muslim majority countries. Um, in North Africa, in the Gulf, a little bit elsewhere as well. Nonetheless, for the longest period of time, um, opinion in Muslim majority countries towards Jews uh, and Israel has been extremely hostile. That's also carried over to many of the people, not all, but many of the people living in Muslim communities in European countries as well. Gunter has written important work on that very subject, as have uh, you. There are lots of big questions that you'll be helping us sort out, I'm sure. Many of us know your work. For those of you who don't, let me simply say a few things about uh, Matthias Kunzu. He's principally a political scientist based in Hamburg, Germany. Um, he, for many years, was associated with the Vidal Sassoon Center for anti-Semitism studies uh, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is the author of several important books, one of them entitled Jihad and Jew Hatred, with Islamism, Nazism, and the roots of 9-11. The connection to Nazism is something I'm sure he'll talk about today. He's done pioneering research on that subject, as has Jeffrey Herf in this country. Uh, we're pleased to have Jeffrey along with us today, uh, as always. Uh, Matthias Künzel also published a book called Germany and Iran. Past and the past and present of a fateful friendship. His most recent book, um, published only last year, not yet in English translation, would in English translation be called Nazis and the Middle East, how Islamic anti-Semitism came into being. In addition to writing these book-length studies, Matthias Künzel frequently publishes important articles and essays in major newspapers and journals in this country and in Germany. He's one of the most active researchers 
on the subject, a wonderful colleague. And we're so grateful to you, Matthias, for joining us today. Let me uh, hand over to you right now. Okay, thank you very much, Elvin. Dear colleagues and dear friends and ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the north of Germany. I would like to thank Elvin for this introduction. Uh, too many good words, I would say. I'm, I would like to say thank you to Günther Jekyll and uh, Elvin Rosenfeld for organizing these outstanding webinar series. I'm very delighted that you invited me to join this series as a speaker and also, I would like to thank everyone who tuned in at this opportunity. And um, well, the topic is controversial, I am talking about today. And so I hope for a vivid discussion after my talk. Um, now I will try to get on my PowerPoint. Just a second. Um, um, it's something. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Is, this is the right one. Yeah. And now from the beginning. Click OK. It's OK. We'll see. Just a second. Yeah. Very so, good. I uh, know. For to the right, to the no. Again, please. Yeah. To the um, left, from begin on. Um, from begin on, links, yes. Open links. But it, it doesn't, oh, oh well, okay. Yeah. No, we have it? Now it's perfect, very good. Now it's use, everyone can see it. Yes. Okay, great. So this is my topic, Islamic antisemitism. But please allow me to dedicate this webinar to Dr. Esther Webman, an outstanding scholar on anti-Semitism in the Arab and Muslim world, and a good friend, a close friend, who passed away in June this year out of the sudden and much, much too early. Unfortunately, there are very few researchers who are able to read, other than me, the Arabic language and who deal seriously with Arab anti-Semitism. And Esther Webman in this respect was a real pioneer. Her death leaves, therefore, a huge void, but her memory will always be for a blessing. So thank you for your attention. Let me now turn to my statement, which I cut into three parts. First, what does the term Islamic anti-Semitism mean? What makes it different from other forms of hatred of Jews? Second, a trip into history. How did Islamic anti-Semitism develop and what was the role of national socialism in this regard? Third, contemporary consequences of Islamic anti-Semitism, especially against the background, and Alvin mentioned it already, of new developments in the Arab world, such as the Abraham Accords. So first point, what does the term Islamic anti-Semitism mean. Usually Muslims and non-Muslims use the same tropes to express hostility towards Jews. Israel-related anti-Semitism, conspiracy myths, etc. Islamic anti-Semitism, however, exists only in Muslim communities. This term is neither a general attack on Islam nor a general accusation against Muslims. It refers to a religiously motivated form of modern anti-Semitism that is based on the fusion of two very different sources, the Islamic anti-Judaism of the 7th and 8th centuries and modern anti-Semitism from Europe, which emerged in the 19th century. The phantasm of a Jewish world conspiracy, which is so central to European anti-Semitism 
was not a feature of the original of the original image of the Jews in Islam. Only in the Christian tradition do Jews appear as a dark and potent force capable of killing even God's only son. In Islamic teachings, it was not the Jews who allegedly murdered the prophet, but the prophet who murdered the Jews. Therefore, some typical features of European anti-Semitism did not appear in the Muslim world. To quote Bernard Lewis, quote, there was no fears of Jewish conspiracy and domination, no charges of diabolic evil. Jews were not accused of poisoning wars or spreading the plague, end quote. Instead, Muslims treated the Jews with contempt and condescending toleration in order to keep them subservient as demis. For Muslims, the Christian idea that the Jews represent a permanent threat to the world seemed absurd. However, with the rise of Islamic anti-Semitism, this significant difference was blurred. My first case in point is the Charter of Hamas published in the year 1988. Article 7 of this charter cites a hadith according to which the prophet Muhammad said, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews. When the Jew will hide behind stones and trees, the stones and trees will say, O oh Muslim, O oh Abdullah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. This image of the Jew, a cowering weakling, corresponds to the Islamic tradition. In contrast, in Article 22 of the same charter, we read the following about the Jews. They were behind the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and most of the revolutions we hear about here and there. They were behind World War I. They were behind World War II. There is no war going on anywhere without having their finger in it. The Hamas Charter thus portrays the Jews on the one hand as degraded, fleeing and hiding, and on the other as the secret and true rulers of the world. These two pictures of the Jews are of course incompatible. It is a contradiction story and therefore a ridiculous construction. Through this mixture, however, both components become radicalized. European anti-Semitism is revitalized by the fanatical moment of radical Islam while the old anti-Judaism of the Quran, now supplemented by the world conspiracy theory, receives a new and deadly quality. One prominent feature of Islamic anti-Semitism is the conviction that Jews everywhere in league with Israel are behind a sinister plot to undermine and eradicate Islam. Let's take a look at Said Qutub's pamphlet our struggle with the Jews written in the early 1950s. Kutub was a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood and one of the most prominent Muslims of the 20th century. After the Arab defeat in 1967, the Saudis spread his anti-Jewish pamphlet Amas in the Islamic world. Our struggle with the Jews links the seventh century with the 20th century as if nothing had happened in the interim. The Jews plotted, this is a quote from our struggle with the Jews. The Jews plotted against the Muslim community from the first day it became a community. This bitter war which the Jews launched against Islam has not been extinguished for even one moment for close on 14 centuries until this moment. The Jews will be satisfied only with the destruction of this religion, Islam. Let me highlight two aspects of this quote. Kutub describes the evil of the Jews as immutable and permanent, transcending time and circumstances. His viewpoint thus merged with European racism. The conclusion is obvious. Since the Jews allegedly can't change their behavior, they must disappear from the world. Secondly, Kutub's revisionism. While the real Jews of Medina never had a chance against Muhammad, 
who to abstract revises this history. It presents the Muslims as the victims and the Jews as aggressors against Islam. This is a paranoid projection. We know this type of paranoid projection from the Nazi ideology. Those who want to kill the Jews justify their intention with a fantasy that the Jews have launched a deadly war against them. Kutub thus radicalized the hatred of Jews in Islamic terms and transferred the territorial dispute about Israel into a religious war with the Muslims representing the party of God and the Jews representing the party of Satan. A variant of Kutub's paranoid delusion is the Al-Aqsa in Danger campaign, which is still virulent today, a topic I will come back to. Let me now summarize my first part. Islamic antisemitism differs from European antisemitism in so far as it adopts the hate image of the overpowering Jew, but combines it with the concept of religious war with all its accompanying ingredients such as a belief in paradise and the martyr ideology. Islamic anti-Semitism also differs from Islamic anti-Judaism in so far as it turns the dimmi Jew into a cosmic danger that is supposed to even threaten the existence of Islam. This transformation of the prophet's Jewish adversaries from a minor nuisance to the incarnation of evil took, of course, some time, which brings me to my second part, the origins of Islamic antisemitism. The pioneers who transferred European antisemitism in the Orient were Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire, especially European priests and diplomats who dragged the blood libel into the Orient. The Dreyfus affair increased the, sp the spread of antisemitism in the French sphere of influence, especially the Maghreb. In 1918, the first edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion appeared in Palestine. However, all of these activities could only reach a tiny minority of Arab Muslims. This began to change only in the 1930s. And amazingly, it was Nazi Germany that initiated this change. In 1937, the Peel Commission's first petition plan for Palestine suggested the creation of a small Jewish substate in Palestine. This alerted Nazi Germany, which now started to incite Arab anti-Semitism in a systematic and massive way. However, and this is of importance, Berlin discovered that its concept of racial anti-Semitism did not find fertile ground in Muslim communities. The level of education of the broad masses is not advanced enough for the understanding of the race theory, wrote a leading Nazi in Egypt. We have to lay all emphasis on the religious motive in our propaganda in the Islamic world. This is the only way to win over the Orientals, urged a member of, German, of the German embassy in Tehran. Therefore, in order to win over the Arabs, the Nazis of all people began to dress up as Muslims. This cartoon was published in the journal Great Britain and the East. You see Mr. Goebbels on the left and Mr. Goering on the right. Both tried to make Hitler look like a Muslim. And that is what happened. The Nazis disguised themselves as Muslims and used and misused Islamic scripture so as to lend credibility to their murderous hate of Jews. From now on, German propaganda combined Islam with anti-Jewish agitation to an extent that had not is there to be known in the modern Muslim world, wrote David Motterdell in his study, Islam and Nazi Germany's War. Sacred texts such as the Quran 
were politicized to incite religious violence. I would like to give you two examples of the Nazis' actions in this regard. The first deals with the brochure Islam and Jewry, or Islam und Judentum, as you can see on the photo. The other with the Nazis' Arabic propaganda, radio propaganda. I start with Islam and Jewry. This is, as far as I know, the very first document that systematically combined religious tropes of the seventh century with elements of Europe's conspiracy theory. It is thus the first written evidence of Islamic antisemitism and the forerunner of Said Qutb's Our Struggle with the Jews. This pamphlet concludes with the following words. The verses from the Quran and Hadith prove to you that the Jews have been the bitterest enemies of Islam and continue to try to destroy it. Do not believe them. They only know hypocrisy and cunning. Hold together, fight for the Islamic thought, fight for your religion and your existence. Do not rest until your land is free of the Jews. Judenfrei, this is a typical Nazi expression which we do not find in early Islamic writing. The first Arabic version of Islam and Jewry was discovered only recently by Dr. Eddie Cohn, a colleague and friend of mine in Tel Aviv. This 30 pages brochure was published in August 1937 in Cairo by Mohammed Ali Al Taher, the director of the Palestinian Arab Bureau of Information in Egypt, who is said to have had many contacts with Nazi agents in Egypt. One month later, in September 1937, this Arabic version was distributed to the 400 participants of the first Pan-Arab Congress in Bludan, a location in Syria. This Congress was organized by Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, in order to fight the two-state solution according to the Peel Plan. In 1938, the German version of Islam in Jewry was published in Berlin under the title Islam Judentum Aufruf des Großmufti an die Islamische Welt 1937, Islam Judaism Call of the Grand Mufti to the Islamic World in 1937. This was the first time that an author of this text, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, was mentioned. Finally, during the Second World War, the Arabic version of this brochure was printed and distributed in large numbers by German forces and translated into several languages. So there is no doubt that the Nazis used this pamphlet for their propaganda purposes, to what extent they were also involved in its creation is, however, still unknown. Please note the timing, 1937, of this first manifesto of Islamic anti-Semitism. The so-called Nakba and Israeli rule over Gaza and the West Bank were still in the distant future. This timing contradicts the widespread assumption that Islamic anti-Semitism developed as a response to an alleged Israeli misdeeds. It was not the behavior of the Zionists that prompted the publication of this hostile text, but rather the very first attempt to agree on a two-state plan. Islamic anti-Semitism was thus invented to destroy the first relevant attempt at a compromise, which had initially been met with a degree, at least, of approval from, them, from some moderate Arabs. My second example concerns the Nazis' most important instrument for propagation of anti-Semitism, including Islamic anti-Semitism, broadcasts in Arabic language. They were broadcast from this shortwave transmitter from Ziesen, a small town south of Berlin. Every night for six years, from April 1939 until April 1945, that station 
spread hatred of Jews in Arabic across the Arab world. Back then, listening to the radio was not a private but a public affair. The men listened to the radio at the bazaar, at marketplaces and in coffee houses. The content of the programs became the dominant topic of conversation which, which multiplied their impact. The subline of this photo says, this is what radio reception looks like in Beirut. Zealous Arab Germany listeners at a break time in Syria. American historian Jeffrey Herf discovered the transcribed manuscripts of these broadcasts and made them known in his brilliant study, Nazi propaganda for the Arab world a must read. Herf highlights the centrality of Quranic teaching in Germany's Arabic language propaganda. Radio season addressed the audience indeed as Muslims, not as Arabs. These broadcasts combined the recitation of Quranic verses with a crude popular anti-Semitism. This is what the British Secret Service reported on the effect of this propaganda. In general, it may be said that the middle, lower middle and lower classes listen to the Arabic broadcast from Berlin with a good deal of enjoyment. They like this racy, juicy stuff which is put over. What the average Palestinian Arab does imbibe, however, is the anti-Jew material. This he wants to hear and to believe, and he does both. To what extent German propaganda, in, to that extent, German propaganda is definitely effective. Berlin's broadcasts in Arabic were well done indeed. They were excellent, there were excellent speakers, carefully selected Arab music and very good sound qualities. At times the BBC people and others were downright desperate as this cartoon shows. To see on the left hand, the Nazi propaganda, again, the word juicy, and on the uh, right hand, the British propaganda with the keyword dry. And you had the German broadcast agitating, mocking, inciting, while the BBC, on the other hand, was dull, unbiased, and of course, informative, but uh, not with the same appeal as the Nazi propaganda. There are reports which show that the anti-Semitic message of Radio Season was popular also among Arabs who otherwise disliked Nazi Germany. That's not particularly surprising because when it came to hating Jews, the Nazis could build on the patterns of early Islamic anti-Judaism and they could instrumentalize the local conflict with the Zionists. I would like to add another aspect which I think is important. The Allies took, of course, various precautions to minimize the effect of radio season. However, they were speechless when it came to the subject of anti-Semitism. They did not want to get a reputation for defending Jews and thus at least partially confirming Nazi propaganda. In this area, the field was completely left to Goebbels and the like. In retrospect, those six years of permanent radio propaganda turned out to be a turning point that divided Middle Eastern history into a before and an after. These years changed the image of the Jews in the Arab world. They fostered an exclusively anti-Jewish reading of the Quran. They popularized the European world conspiracy myths and they shaped a genocidal rhetoric towards Zionism and Israel. Gradually, the Arabs adopted the guidelines of Islamic anti-Semitism and the idea that the Jews wanted to destroy Muslims and extinguish Islam as Radio Tzazen kept saying. This Nazi propaganda postcard in Arabic language, subtitle Roosevelt, Churchill and Weizmann distribute 
the Arab lands to the Jews was supposed to stir up that very fear. This hatred and these paranoid fantasies survived the war and also influenced the leaders of the Arab world in the post-war years. This is one of the reasons why they reacted so horrified to the United Nations partition plan of November 1947. In my new book, Nazis und der Nahe Osten, wie der islamische Antisemitismus entstand, or Nazis in the Middle East, how Islamic antisemitism uh, came into being, currently available only in German, I show the extent to which the aftermath of Nazi propaganda contributed to the Arab decision to attack the just founded Israel in May 1948. It was also the opinion of Ali Mahir, the former prime minister of Egypt, that Arab opposition to Zionism was at least partly produced or strengthened by the Nazi propaganda in the Arab East. Let me summarize the second part. The history of Islamic antisemitism reveals the audacity with which German Nazis used Islam for the fulfillment of their political interests. They streamlined the Quran's contradictionary statements about Jews for anti-Semitic purposes. Yet this brief encounter between Nazi ideology and the Arab world had consequences that continued to reverberate in the Middle East. Until this day, the anti-Jewish passages from the early writings of Islam are repeated incessantly. To this day, world affairs are explained by using the protocols of the elders of Zion. Until this day, leading representatives of the Palestinian Authority regard any attempt to normalize relations with Israel as high treason. Let me come back now to the present and to the question of today's significance of Islamic anti-Semitism in the Arab world. Today's Islamic anti-Semitism takes many forms. One example is the Al-Aqsa in Danger campaign. Amin al husseini the Mufti of Jerusalem, started it almost 100 years ago with a claim that the Jews were eager to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the third most important sanctuary of Islam. Recent mass mobilizations based on this lie took place as recently as July 2017 when Israel tried to upgrade the safety equipment at the Temple Mount. And again, at the end of 2017, when the United States moved the embassy to Jerusalem, the Palestinian Authority condemned Trump's decision in religious terms as, quote, aggression against Islam, aggression against the Quran, aggression against the Muslims, aggression against the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and aggression against humanity. My second example relates to Islamic antisemitism as a means to distort history. The Al-Aqsa and Danger lie is indeed supplemented by a second big lie, the laughable assertion that there is no connection at all between the Jews and Jerusalem. Take the example of Professor Mohammed Wahib Al-Husseini, an archaeologist from Jordan. An archaeologist from Jordan, sorry. The Israelites, I quote, are unable to convince anyone anywhere in the world that they have a historic right to this blessed land. They did not have any existence in history in Palestine and especially not in Jerusalem. No scholar supports them in this. So this is unbelievable, but there are hundreds of quotes like this. You may well laugh at such nonsense, but unfortunately, those who say these things mean business. A new front of religious war is being opened here and Islamic anti-Semitism is being fed. Like the denial of the Holocaust, this temple denial campaign also 
insinuates the presence of a large scale Jewish conspiracy in which the Jews through their power in politics and media are able to suppress the real truth about Jerusalem. Finally, and most importantly, there is the ongoing anti-normalization campaign. We are currently witnessing, as you all know, the possible development of a new Arab world that is no longer united against Israel. Here you see Bibi next to the foreign minister of the Emirates and Bahrain's foreign minister on the right. The remark by Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman that the Israelis, quote, have the right to live peacefully in their state was also important. Both developments indicate that, it's, that it is not the Quran as such that hinders the normalization of relations between Arabs and Israel, but its anti-Semitic interpretation. This period of thaw also triggers new debates about anti-Semitism and Islam. For decades, the Quran has been used to justify hatred of Jews and of Israel. Today, however, many articles and sermons originating from the Gulf countries say the opposite. Supporters of the peace agreement refer, refer to Quranic verses that seem to show Islam's alleged preference for peace. They cite, for example, Surah 8, verse 61, quote, if they are inclined to peace, make peace with them. The highest cleric from the Emirates announced that the peace agreement with Israel was to be welcomed also for religious reasons, as it would help achieve fundamental Sharia goals. The largest non-governmental organization of imams in the world, the Global Imams Council, even adopted the working definition of anti-Semitism as agreed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Quote, we understand the importance of clerical presence in these peace developments, explains the head of this organization, Council President Iman al Budaiya. This is an amazing development. It goes without, without saying that we have to remain skeptical and wait and see whether these are just fine words or whether the school curricula or the reporting on Israel will change on the ground and whether the Arab advocates of peace with Israel will be able to move freely and safely in their respective countries. Crucial, however, is the fact that three powerful centers of resistance to normalization are currently trying to do everything possible to torpedo this hopeful development. The Sunni Islamists led by Erdogan, the Shiite Islamists led by Khamenei, and the Iranians uh, and, and the uh, leadership of the Palestinians led by Mahmoud Abbas. Just as Islamic anti-Semitism was used in 1937 to prevent compromises, Islamic anti-Semitism is also today their major tool to intimidate the Arab leaderships and populations and to quickly destroy the growing hopes for peace. To quote Ayatollah Khamenei, those who normalize relations with Israel break with the Quran and the Islamic faith. To quote Hamas, the Emirates are, quote, committing high treason against Allah, the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims. Normalization with Israel goes against what Allah revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. The Palestinian Authority instructed the Palestinian Imams to use anti-Jewish verses of the Quran for their sermons, such as Surah 2, verse 120, quote, and never will the Jews or the Christians approve of you until you follow their religion, end quote. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and Palestine even issued a fatwa, which indicates that residents of the Emirates are forbidden to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque and that Palestinians should boycott and shun them. This list could easily be extended. Thus, we have to conclude 
that religion is once again being deliberately placed in the service of anti-Semitism. Once promoted by Nazi Germany, Islamic anti-Semitism continues to affect perception and policy in the Muslim world today. Nobody knows how the fight between the protagonists of the Jewish friendly interpretation of the Quran and those of an anti-Jewish interpretation will end. We know, however, that the outcome of this dispute can make the difference between peace or war. Islamic anti-Semitism, as we have seen, is a relatively recent invention that gives at least some hope that it can be overcome in the inner Islamic discourse over the next few decades. Thank you for your attention.